So our next speaker is uh, Mario Leclerc. And uh, in, in the center, we have Seth Marder. And uh, I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with Mario myself, but Seth said, you've definitely got to have him speak in this, uh, in this virtual symposium. So this is going to be very exciting. I'm really looking forward to, to your talk, Mario. Direct heteroadulation, a new tool for polymer chemistry. It's a lot of pressure. Thank you. <laughs> Do you hear me correctly? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it will be more a tutorial about what we, from the polymer chemistry side, what we learned from the direct heteroadulation reaction. And, and I hope to teach you uh, tricks about how to make high mugloid materials. Uh, I would call myself as the guest coming from the north. So this is where I, I am at Laval University in the nice city of Quebec City. Uh, this is the St. Lawrence River. It's about, I would say, 500 kilometers from Boston, uh, the capital of the province of Quebec. Uh, you, you have seen this uh, slide more or less from, from Colin. I'm also working on conjugated polymers uh, like Seth, Christine, and Colleen in, in your network. Uh, you probably heard, I don't want to make a long introduction about conjugated polymer, but it's a combination in the same materials. You can combine very nice electrical properties. Uh, they are good chromophores, so they strongly absorb in the UV, visible, or even near infrared range. And at the same time, you're, you're dealing with high molecular weight materials, so you have quite good mechanical properties. So you're dealing with polymeric materials which are processable, lightweight, uh, with, with, which are flexible, but at the same time, you can have very nice electrical and optical properties. And that has dealt to the development of what we call organic electronics or printable electronics or even plastic electronics. It's all the same for me. Uh, it's, it's now on the market. You have organic light emitting, light emitting diodes or pellets, polymeric light emitting diodes. So this is on the market now. You can deal with field effect transistors, which are printed. Our field of expertise is more on what is called a flexible solar cells, so printed solar cells. Uh, you have seen some picture from Colin about, uh, let's say, bus stop with, with flexible solar cells and so on. And we, we, there are a lot of people in the world uh, dealing with those molecules, but this is the kind of state-of-the-art molecules that you're dealing with to make these flexible solar cells. And frankly, uh, it's close to pharma compounds. I mean, it's more and more complicated now. This is why, why six, it's what we call a small molecules, although it's not that small, uh, with a lot of steps. Uh, this is the n-type uh, conducting materials in, in this blend. And this is what we call the p-type polymeric material, which gives you the flexibility and the mechanical strength. And, and they are not so simple. If you if I come back to the starting point, you, you see just simple repeated unit of conjugated units like the benzene or thiophene. This is now where we are. And, and frankly, we need organic chemists now to help us to, to find new strategies to make them, uh, to make uh, simple, I would say, uh, sentence of those materials. So I will not discuss what we call small molecules. I will try to explain how we design and fabricate those uh, uh, conjugated molecules here. It's based, most of the time, it's based on what we call electron rich unit with alternating with what we call electron poor unit. And that gives you, it's called, uh, you can call them a kind of push pull copolymers. If you deal with those push pull copolymers or electron rich, electron poor unit, it's possible to fine tune the band gap of the final material. So just to try to explain it rapidly, if you have an electron rich unit like a carbazole, let's say, and you co polymerize it with an electron poor unit, those fluorinated benzene rings that we have seen from Colin, for instance, you will get a, 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 a small band gap co polymer. So the homo level of the resulting co polymers will be determined by the HOMO level of the electron rich unit and the LUMO level or the, the conducting band, if you want, of the final copolymers will be pinned or determined by the LUMO level of the electron poor unit. So therefore, from the starting, I would say, copolymers, you may have a view of what will be the final copolymers, alternating copolymers. And to, to make those 
electron rich, electron poor copolymers, there are different strategies. And one with, which is very, very successful, it's based on Suzuki coupling. So you need bar boron esters or boronic acid copolymerized with dibromo compounds in a mixture of toluene and aqueous solution, for instance. And by mixing, alternating, I should say, cabozole with those electron poor units here, you can tailor the electronic and optical properties of the final products. And to show you exactly what I mean, this is an example of, this is the carbosol unit here. If you make the homopolymer, you have a colorless copolymer, co homopolymer with a band gap of 3V. So this is transparent. The, the, there is no absorption in the visible range. But if you copolymerize carbosol with different electron poor unit, you see you can tune the band gap from 3V down to 1.1E. So you can even anticipate what will be the final optical and electrical properties of those copolymers. And Suzuki coupling is very, very popular for carbosol, fluorine, or benzene-ring monomers. This is the, the most used uh, synthesis for uh, making conjugated copolymers. If you're do dealing with copolymers daily, having thiophene thiophene couplings, the Suzuki coupling doesn't work that, that well because they are not so stable. And, and now state of the art still use is the what I call a steely coupling. So, so you need 10 derivatives here. And this is the final product here. But let's say that you prepare 100 grams of this co-monomer, you will produce clearly roughly 50 grams of waste of tin. So although it's possible to run this experiment in your lab and prepare 100 milligrams or even one gram of this copolymer, it's forbidden for large scale applications. So the large company, the big companies in the field cannot use this reaction for making them, I would say commercially available. So although it's very popular in the lab and you have a lot of, I would say scientific papers dealing with this kind of reaction, it's forbidden for large scale production. So this is really outside my field, but we, we, were, we became aware of direct relation or direct hetero relation from the work from Kate Fanu, the late Kate Fanu, a former uh, professor at University of Ottawa. He came to give a talk here at Laval and he showed us these very nice examples where you have a stoichiometry. I will come back later on that, why it's so important, but you have a one to one stoichiometry and you have a yield of closely 87%, and you have exactly the, 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 the small molecule that you were expecting from the starting materials. And for us, really, this is a gift from the organic chemist to the field of conjugated polymers. And what was very, very impressive, this is the work from Ozawa, and Colleen already mentioned that. If you start with the monobrominated thiophene unit here, it's possible to make what is called the P3HT, so the regio regular polytriexyl thiophene, which is a very, very important material in the field of conjugated materials. And it got a number of rich molecular weight of 30,000. That means that this N here, which is the degree of polymerization, so the N will tell you how many units I have in my polymeric chain with a number of rich molecular weight of 30,000. It means an N of around 200. So you have 200 times the same reaction with the, I would say, this CBR bound here attacking the CH bound here. And although we don't draw it here, there is a, a CH bound at the, what we call the beta position, but the selectivity was very good. So we have a high molecular weight materials, well-defined. It was very, very impressive. And to really convince it with you why it's so impressive, if you take the well-known Carotero's equation, which is that will apply to any polycondensation you want to make, okay? It could be a nylons, polyesters, or conjugated polymers. This reaction will apply. If you want a degree of polymerization of 50, you need a conversion, P is the conversion or the yield, if you want, of 98%. If you don't have a reaction with a 98, 99% yield, you want to achieve a high degree of formalization. Moreover, 
you have to take care of the stoichiometry. So let's say Na, uh, this is the, I would say the stoichiometry of the number of acidic moieties in your molecules. And Nb, this is the aiming group here. The stoichiometry has to be perfect, one-to-one, -one, no degradation. And to achieve, let's say, 50 here, you need a perfect stoichiometry and a very high yield. And very few reactions can, I would say, give you those numbers or, or those, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, requirements. So you need a very high yield, very stable co-monomers, very stable um, molecules during the reaction, and, and very pure materials. So you have to have very, very pure, no water, no, I would say, no humidity. It's very, very important to achieve high molecular materials. And, and just rapidly, we sometimes uh, characterize the polymeric materials with their so-called mole molecular weight distribution, which is the ratio between the weight average molecular weight and the number of rich molecular weight with a conversion of one. The molecular weight distribution has to be two. So sometimes people are very happy with the degree at a molecular weight distribution of 1.5. It just means this is not a well done polymerization reaction. The polycondensation reaction has to give you a polydispersity of two. So those requirements are very important to achieve high molecular weight materials. And also you have to deal about selectivity. And I took this picture from a, a, a review written by Seth Morrow and, and Christian Lascombe, just to show you how selective has to be the reaction if you want to apply it to a polymerization reaction. Let's say you want to convert this monobrominated typhene unit to get, to get this, I would say, well-defined backbone here. As a function of the polymerization, the number of remaining units here, H-bound at the alpha position, will decrease. And you will get, let's say you have a degree of polymerization of 100 for this growing polymer chain. It means you have 100 H-bound at the beta position for one remaining H bound here at the alpha position. So the selectivity to get well-defined backbone has to be more than 100. So you need a yield close to 100%, a very good ratio or stoichiometry between your, uh, I would say, uh, reacting units and a selectivity close to 100. Because with polymeric chain, you cannot remove the byproducts. If you have beta branching here, it is covalently linked and you cannot remove it. So you have to deal with defects and you, you cannot make, I would say sublimation or uh, uh, purification. You cannot purify a final copolymer co or a final polymer. So the selectivity from the starting point has to be very high. Uh, so we were very, very impressed by those results here from, from Ozawa and others. And we applied this reaction to this, uh, uh, I would say, and this is a typical example of a conjugated polymers for a uh, photovoltaic application. So this is the usual way we use it to make this copolymer here. This is the electron rich unit with tin derivatives and the dibromo on the electron poor unit. And the base cases, even in my lab of Fakiti, Tobin Marx, and, and uh, probably, probably Christian Luscom also, you can get a, a, a number of rich molecular weight of about 10,000. And why? Because this monomer is not so stable. And upon eating with those catalysts, you, you're losing those thin groups here, and you're just, uh, I would say, ending the reaction at low molecular weight uh, at low molecular weights. And so we took this typical example here where we put, where we have just two CH bonds exactly where we want. So there is no possibility of beta branching here. And we use this bitaiofin unit here with two bromo groups here. And there are two remaining CH bonds here in the middle of these bitaiofin units. But we thought at that time that from steric hindrance, those, react, uh, those CH bond here should be, I would say, sterically hindered and shouldn't be, shouldn't be so reactive. So we were very happy to see that we got a well, I would say, well-defined copolymers with a number of rich molecular weight of 50,000, which means, I don't know by heart, but it's clearly around 20, 30 repeated units in your copolymers. 
to be sure that we have a, exactly a similar core pattern that what we got from steely coupling, we did run uh, NMR spectrum. And, and frankly, the NMR spectra of polymers are not so well defined. They are always broad. It's because it is it gives you a viscous solution and it's not it, it's typical for polymeric conjugated polymers. But I just want to show you that this is the NMR we got from steely coupling. And those little extra peaks here are related to what we call the N group. So the final groups here has a different, I would say, uh, chemical environment from what is the, within the polymeric chain. And this is the N groups here. And you can even calculate the molecular weight from the ratio of those N groups here and the major groups here from the conjugated backbone. And from P1, this is what we got from uh, direct heterolytic relation reaction. And frankly, we got something which is comparable. I'm not saying it's better. I'm not saying we got perfect co polymers. I'm just saying that we got comparable materials with comparable optical, electronic, electrical properties, mechanical properties, and so on. I have another example of an NMR of such conjugated co polymers. The only difference here, you have a third thiophene unit with this uh, TPD co monomer here. And we got those large groups, which is just usual for conjugated polymers, but you have a well-defined backbone. There is no evidence, I would say, no strong evidence. So I'm not saying, I repeat, it's not perfect. There are probably some branching and some defects, but it's probably less than one or 2%. But you, you have a well-defined uh, NMR spectrum from what you anticipate from those uh, core monomers. Then we apply this reaction. So this is more or less the same, I would say, catalytic uh, system that Colin described with palladium, uh, two plus, phosphine, uh, an acidic uh, additive in basic condition, in THF, toluene, for instance. So we, we, we started with this carbazole, uh, dibromoc carbazole, and the DPP co-monomer that we just heard uh, one hour ago. And we got this copolymer here. Usually, you prepare this copolymer from Suzuki coupling. So, from Suzuki coupling, this is the NMR you get. You have this little little extra peak here. I repeat, it's related to what we call the N groups. And by increasing the molecular weight, you should see it disappearing. So, this is what we see here. And we got more or less the same copolymer or the same structure from what we call the direct heterolation reaction. In one case, we got close to 40,000 uh, uh, molecular weight and higher than 50,000 in this case. And you have a well-defined copolymer, co even if you have a lot of CH bound here. And I repeat, if you want to avoid branching and even cross-linking of those materials, the selectivity has to be very high. So uh, I'm coming from Canada. So this is, uh, I won't say this is our national sport, but this is very popular here. Uh, if you publish in Angevente, ask, don't ask me why, but we have to make something which is spherical. And so we use this curling uh, spot here. So we think that direct heterolation in general or direct correlation polycondensation is, a, is the winning shot. You can remove tin from the game and with one stone, you're exactly at the right spot. You can have high molecular materials. It's clearly greener there is no toxic waste. Uh, you, re you reduce the number of steps, and clearly you will decrease the cost of those uh, co polymers. So there is a, a, a spin off company here at Laval, it's called Brian Matters, where they, they make those kind of conjugated polymers from direct relation. And in most cases, they can have lower prices for, I would say, comparable uh, co polymers. So we were very pleased by those starting uh, reaction. So we test them with, with different co-monomers just to see the scope of this reaction. So this is a co-polymer in the field, which is important. It's called PQT12. It's a very good P-type transistor. And it's usually done from an oxidative reaction. So we, we start with dibromine bitaliophene here, the unsubstituted bitaliophene here. And we get a well-defined co-polymer co with well-defined NMR optical electrical problem. You can get the same final product, but in this case, you start with the dibromobiotiophene and the unsubstituted, or unsubstituted, 
non-brominated beta-ethene unit here. And in principle, you should get the same final copolymer. And in this case, it didn't work, nothing. So if you put the bromo groups here with those alkyl side chain next to it, it works. The selectivity on beta ethene seems very good, but in this case, it doesn't work. And our first, I would say, hypothesis was that we thought that when you put the bromo groups here, you make those CH bond a little more acidic or a little more reactive. And it could give you side reaction, branching, uh, or even cross-linking, or you may have debromination. We don't really know why, but it's clear that this is the, the good strategy to, to get this copolymer, and this one won't work. So if you know this movie, uh, at the beginning, when we started our work on direct heterohyalation reaction, we, 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 we anticipated that the problem would come with typhine unit, the unsubstituted typhine unit, we thought that the selectivity between the CH bond here at the alpha position won't be enough compared to the C beta position here, but it doesn't seem to be the case, at least in the condition we're using. But the bad guys is this one, we think. Uh, if you put the bromo groups on a thiophene unit or furan or pyrrol, this kind of five membrane aromatic rings, but especially with thiophene, you slightly activate this CH bond here and, and make the, the selectivity or the reactivity not perfect, I would say less perfect. In the case of the bromo, phenyl, carbazole, fluorine, isoindigo, those CH bond here adjacent or next to the BR, CBR bond are not reactive enough. So in this case, it's reactive enough to make side reaction. This is what we believe. No proof, I repeat, but in this case, we think they, they, they are not reactive enough. Indeed, you can run this kind of reaction in toluene, which is just a, a methylated uh, benzene ring. So we think, we're not sure, this is the bad guy. So just to give you a general overview of what is possible right now, at least from, from our point of view, if you put a CPR bone on the phenyl, fluorine, carbazole, isoindigo, any six member green, and if you want to make a reaction on a CH bone that, that is alkylated or even non substituted, the reactivity is good enough and the selectivity is good enough. On this side, if you put the CBR bone with an alkyl side chain next to it, so there is no possibility of side reaction at this beta position because it is blocked. Are substituted, you get a well-defined copolymer. Selectivity is good enough. The still remaining problem and trying to find solution, and we hope that some organic chemists will find new methodologies for, for to get a better selectivity. When you have a CBR bound with no protection at the beta at the adjacent beta position, it's still uh, it is still problematic. It is still problematic, and we would try and working very hard to find new solution or a new, I would say, conditions to enhance the selectivity or the, it could be also the stability. Perhaps the CBR bound here is not that stable compared to this one. We, we don't really know. To help us to get more, I would say, uh, not understanding, but to try to predict, somehow predict, I would say, uh, which monomer could be co-polymerized with which monomer I will show you those uh, DFT calculation of the activity, activation energy, which is related more or less to the reactivity of your position. So if you start with this unit, for instance, uh, I, would, I prefer this one, the alkoxy benzo BDT. I don't know the other details. Uh, the unsubstituted unit here, you have an activation of energy of 25.1 kilocal per mole and 28.7 here. So there is a, a 3.6 kilocal difference. So the selectivity is quite good. More than 100, 100 times more reactive here than here. But if you put the bromo group here to make a co-monomer, you make this CH bound here much more reactive. And indeed, you cannot make the homopolymer from, from this unit because you have to, you have a, a I would say, um, 
a difference between 25.1 and 26.7, so 1.6 kilocal. So there is a probability to have side reaction at that position. But if you keep this cobalamer and want to copolymerize it with, with fluorinated thiophene unit or fluorinated benzene ring, as we have seen earlier, this one is much more reactive than this position, so it's possible to copolymerize this unit with that co-monomer. So, in, in other words, all co-monomers can go. The reactivity and the selectivity for a given co-monomer is a function of the partner and the reactivity of the partner. So, some co-monomers are bad for, for some co-monomers, but could be good enough for other combination of co-monomers. So, this is just a tool. I'm not saying this is perfect. Uh, I'm just saying that it, it's, it's a tool to try to get a better understanding of what co-monomers can be copolymerized with what co-monomers. So this is just a tool. Uh, rapidly, I just want to tell you that it's possible now to run direct heterolization polymerization outside uh, the glove box. We don't need uh, nitrogen, it could be done in air. It could be done with water, so it's possible to make what we call user-friendly, robust, scalable, high molecular weight at ambient pressure. This is important for scale-up uh, if you can run it in a flask instead of uh, pressurized uh, uh, vials. It's also possible to run polymerization reaction with this uh, tool, continuous flow synthesis. So what is soluble uh, is just pump. And what is not soluble is put on the column reactor, like cesium carbonate or the p-valic acid. And it's possible to get high molecular weight from this. Uh, this is just an example, but I just want to say that continuous flow synthesis uh, can, be, can be used for this direct heterolization polymerization. And there are two, three examples in the literature uh, from John Reynolds, for instance, uh, at Georgia Tech. I think he just made a recent example on, on, on that. So we think that direct DHAP, what we call, can be a new tool uh, for making conjugated polymers. I repeat, there are just very, there are few reactions that are good enough, reactive enough, selective enough, and, and stable enough to be uh, utilized by the polymer chemists to make conjugated polymers. Of course, it's steady coupling, the Suzuki coupling, we need this direct heterolation reaction should be a new tool, but we think it still needs a fine tuning. So it's not, it's not that simple. You have to, uh, for a new set of co-monomers, co you have to find new condition or at least adapt your condition. There is no general trends about uh, what is the best co, uh, let's say the, what is the best pre-catalyst and all the best condition, the best solvent and so on. So there is still need for some fine tuning, but everything being equal, and uh, this more or less the slide that we got from Colleen uh, earlier. This is the conventional cross coupling reaction where you have to activate, you have to make an um, uh, organometallic compound, zinc, uh, tin, uh, or even boronic esters, uh, and make a copolymerization with brominated, most of the time it's brominated or iodinated uh, co monomer to get this uh, conjugated alternating co polymers, but you have a lot of waste. In this case, uh, you just have uh, HBr or HI. Uh, there are some work from uh, Christine, I think, and, and um, what is his name at uh, South Carolina, California, uh, Thompson, uh, Brian Thompson, where he, he now makes what we call this oxidar. So you can oxidize or oxidize more or less oxidize directly the CH bond here and get a, a, a high molecular materials from CH-CH bond. It's quite useful for homopolymers to make alternating copolymers. Clearly, it's not obvious. So for making copolymers, alternating copolymers, you need a different reaction between CH bond and, and CBR bond. I think, yeah, it's more or less what I, I wanted to discuss with you. and. and um, just open to listen to your question if uh, you have. Yeah. Okay, that's really interesting. And uh, what I thought was particularly interesting is, you know, we, from a more traditional synthetic organic chemistry, we're trying to develop 
these predictive rules and it's clear that you're bringing that into your program as well. Yes. So I had a question for you. If you wanted to go for a really big polymer, uh, yeah. would you start with thinking about um, seed functionalization strategies or would you, would you think about a, a still a stilly coupling? Where, 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 does, where is the field currently at? The, the people will start with silly coupling to be sure that they will get something and, and learn about the materials. Uh, I, 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 I want to clarify one point. We don't need that high molecular weight materials, okay? Uh, there is what we call a saturation of the properties after, let's say, 50 repeating units. If you increase to 100, 200, you will just increase the viscosity of the material and the processability will be more difficult. But you don't need 100, 200. You don't need a polydispersity index of one. I think if you can reach 50, you will get more or less the optimum properties that you can get from this material. So there is no need. So most of the people will start with Steely or Suzuki coupling, and, die, and then we will try to adapt it and, and convince us that we can spend time for direct heterolization organization. Something else, perhaps sometimes if you move from steely to direct correlation organization, you have to redesign your core monomers. So the, the way you cut your materials and pieces could be different depending on the strategy you're using. If you see my point, you have different units. So uh, if I can come back, uh, I have an example. Uh, this one, if you take this one, uh, we, we, we put the bromo here, bromo here and the bromo here and the DCH here. But you could prepare, uh, you could have copanerized this unit. Oh, it's not easy. Uh, we can take this one. You can put the bromo groups here or the bromo groups here. You can decide to attach one thiophene on one side one thiophene on the other side and make a homopolarization reaction. So the way you cut your materials in pieces depends on your strategy. Okay. Yes, that's great. Yes. Um, no, that, that's wonderful. Let's see. Um, I don't, oh, there is, uh, yes, there is a question. Um, how do the molecular weight regimes you can access compare to catalyst transfer polymerization like those utilized by Anne McNeil's group? Uh, I don't know in details. Uh, uh, I would say it, it, it's so dependent upon the, the, the nature of the co monomer. So McNeil is, I know, I remember, but, but it, it, it may be good for us given class of co monomers and you, you cannot beat them uh, with those uh, those ones. And for dark heterolization, there are other co monomers that work very, very well. So there is no unique answer for all materials. So I, I cannot really make uh, a fair comparisons. Uh, it's strongly dependent upon the nature of the co monomers. Yeah, uh, at this moment. Well, thank you. I think uh, it seems to me that uh, CH functionalization in the materials field is as healthy like it is in, in the more regular organic synthesis. There's some really exciting things you can do, but there's still room to continue to do research. Uh, in it. It, it started more or less five years okay. ago. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mario, for joining us. It's been a really excellent talk. And let's uh, have a round of applause to all of the speakers for a, for a great session. Thanks very much.